My name is uh, Warren McFarlane, and my job is to quickly get out of the way this morning that we have put together an absolutely outstanding panel uh, to talk about uh, board challenges, that we have uh, Judy Habercorn, who is the only member of our advanced management program who had to go through it twice before we let her through. And on top of that, she told me I didn't run a much better faculty the second time than the first time. So Judy is here to talk about you know, her experiences. Uh, Carolyn Daniels comes from the you know, OPM uh, background and I think has a very interesting story. Alan Merrim from the MBA and Marcy from the company and now the foundation. In thinking about at, at OPM. OPM. And in order to be most useful, I thought this morning, instead of my describing the great details, I would ask each of the panelists to talk for about five or six minutes about their board experience and one or two board challenges that they have faced. And I think this is going to lead nicely into an interactive discussion between us and them. And so with that, let me just start because Judy's right beside me with Judy and we'll work right on down the road. All right. Uh, before I start on background, just out of curiosity, how many of you serve on public company boards today? Good. How many of you are here because it, it's an aspiration? And how many of you uh, are CEOs who might like to know how to work with your board more effectively? Okay, good. <laughs> That's, a, that's very, that's very, <laughs> very helpful. Uh, let me say by way of background that uh, I started out at the school as an HBS wife in 1969. And uh, the school has changed a great deal in that time, as have I. I used to drop my husband off at the bottom of the steps of Baker Library, and I would proceed to my little job at the phone company downtown. And of course, the purpose of that job was to pay the rent while we got him through business school. Well, that turned into a 32-year career that uh, spanned a lot of geography and a lot of different disciplines, mostly operations and marketing. And um, I had the great privilege of coming to this campus on my own in 1990 in the AMP, and uh, as Warren referenced, I was pulled out after the first month and told I was being given a big promotion, and that was the end of Harvard. I didn't need that anymore, but I said, no, no, it was never a means to an end for me, so you're going to have to send me back, and they, and they did that. Um, board service caused me, uh, or preparing for this panel and thinking about my board service, caused me to put together a few fun facts that I hadn't really focused on before. And having told you that I had a great 32-year career at what is now Verizon and predecessor organizations, I actually have had a 40-year board service career, if you add up uh, the years and multiply by the boards. And that really is quite a bit of experience in a bunch of varied uh, industries and companies. And I say to those of you who are here aspirationally that I recommend it highly. I think it is a wonderful way to improve your own performance in your day jobs, if you will. It's a great chance to learn different things about different companies and industries in a way that you would not have an opportunity to do in any other way. And it really is a way to use what you have learned at the school and everywhere else in your life to the real benefit of a lot of people. So um, a lot of you will be thinking about your first board and how you come to get onto your first board, the first one always being the key in my experience. And uh, my first board actually came through one of my HBS classmates which was wonderful. And uh, one of the greatest joys of my life was later to be instrumental in inviting my classmate and friend, Janet Clark, who's sitting right back there, to join her first board 
as my colleague. And interestingly, this was actually a board that had three women at the time I joined in 1992. And you don't run into that very often. That caused me to think a little about the numbers. And um, the fact that I now sit, I'm down to one board by choice and design. And uh, if you had told me in 1992 that I would be the only woman on a board on which I was sitting in 2013, I would have said that's not possible. Um, I'm very glad that my first one was one on which three women served because I can assure you that the dynamic is very different when you're the only woman in the room um, from when there are three of you. But I went back and did a little math and discovered that 50% of my board service, I have been the only woman. And 20%, I have been one of three, and the remainder, one of two. And in the case where I was one of two, I was, in every case, instrumental in recruiting the second woman. So um, thinking about the challenges of board service that I want to share with you, um, I have sort of come to focus on the CEO. And there are a lot of reasons for that. You read a great deal today about governance issues and um, accounting issues and the compensation committee and what I call sort of the mechanics of board service. But for this morning, I thought it might be useful, and this is by way of provoking discussion. I'm, I'm not purporting to give you the definitive answer on any of this. But what occurred to me is that really, as I reflect back on my 40 years of board service, the most important thing I have done as a board member is to select, compensate, and evaluate the CEO. And that if you get that right as a board member, most of the rest will fall into place. Now, um, that's not always an easy job. It might sound a lot easier to you than in fact it is. And just to give you some perspective, I have overseen seven CEO transitions. That means a lot of searches. It also means um, unfortunate circumstances that cause you to have to replace a CEO. Um, Perhaps one of the other panel members will talk about succession planning, which is very important. But I can assure you, if you don't have a good succession plan, you're going to have a scramble because there are lots of demands. Time is your enemy when you don't have a, a CEO in place. I actually had one die. And stories are often powerful in terms of informing us. And, um, you would probably not believe that a brief five years ago, the board could convene only to be told that the CEO was in fact in the hospital in a coma, having had surgery, and none of the board members had even known he was ill. And he subsequently died. Think about the implications of that for a board of directors. It's really dramatic, and I'm I'm happy to answer more questions about that, but um, it, again, the, having the right CEO in place is critical to almost anything you do as a board member. The second challenge that I want to throw out to you is, having said that I presided over seven CEO transitions, is the need to replace a CEO. <clears throat> I would say it to you this way. When you know there's a problem, it's almost always already too late. And you don't know what you don't know. And finding out what you don't know is really not generally a pleasant experience. Now, um, <laughs> 
how to prevent that, obviously, is to make a good choice in the first place. But the final comment I want to make to you about CEOs is there is not a perfect CEO for every single circumstance. The person you want for a turnaround may not be the person to take the company to the next level. Um, the person for the startup is not the person necessarily to grow the business. So the real trick is to have the right person for the right time and to know that. And it's not as easy as it looks. Terrific. Karen? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great stories. Thank you. Uh, you certainly have prompted some of my thinking. Uh, my background is on the private side. Um, I came to Harvard uh, after running my own company for 10 years and my, it's been the OPM program, and my experience was, first of all, learning how much I knew. I was so grateful for that because I had no idea what I was doing up to that time, I thought. So that was really nice. And then, of course, learning what I didn't know, and that was enormously beneficial. Um, I have a family company, and my experience is, has been more on family boards and also in university boards. And they're a little different, certainly, from the public boards. Um, it's, uh, but we have the same problems. <laughs> I, the CEO, of course, is really important, but what I wanted to talk about today is more the, the composition of the board and the problems there. Um, I know that in the Fortune 500 companies, the, the board planning and, and the organization of the board is much more um, a rote kind of a thing. We have term limits and that kind of thing are much more common, but on the private boards, it's much less common and more problematic because, of course, you end up with board people that have been there forever and their skills are no longer relevant, or you end up with people that are inappropriately serving on the board because they're a crony or you know, whatever. So replacing those people or moving them on is a real challenge. And then, of course, getting the board to set term limits when they all like being there <laughs> is the other problem, because... Who wants to leave? I love my job. You know, it's it's so much fun. I'm making money. I'm making a difference. Who wouldn't like that? So that I think is a tremendous problem. Um, family boards are very different, though, from a public board because you've got the family dynamics. Marcy and I were talking about this earlier. We both have tremendous experience with that. Families are <laughs> bring in a whole nother level of challenge. And um, my own personal experience with my own company was that I, um, when we started the company, there were three of us. There was a, another man and my father and I. My father and I had 50% of the company. He had the other 50%. When my father passed away, I inherited six brothers and sisters to help run the company. Ha. <laughs> <laughs> And I had a 50% partner who wasn't participating in the business, but had a, an ownership. And one day he called me up uh, about a year and a half after we'd started and said, I don't want to be in business with your family anymore. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so after the process of going through a, a very difficult business divorce and getting the family back owning the company solely without him any longer, then I had the challenge of working with all the brothers and sisters to bring forward, to take forward and build an organization. And those of you in family businesses know that there's a huge difference between the family's interests, the, the, the passive shareholders, and the active shareholders. And so my job became helping them learn to feed the goose that's laying the golden egg. That's, that's really what it's about when you're in a family company. And I think the only way you can take it forward successfully is to learn to listen to the family, to get them to um, use their, uh, um, bring forward their interest and express themselves in a, gaining an appreciation of what the company is doing for them and what they need from the company. And to have, as the CEO, to be able to listen to that. Not so easy sometimes but very important. So I think that um, there are many family stories gone wrong, but there are many family stories gone right. And I think if you can get a family in a position where it is 
successfully working together, understanding the value of the enterprise and how the enterprise is taking care of the family, then you are, will be much more successful going forward with the family. That's not to say I didn't have to buy some of the family out and <laughs> move things around. Um, but uh, uh, that's the way it often goes. And, and a board, another board I'm working on right now is also a family company. The same, very same issues. They don't change. They don't change. So I, that's what I would offer this morning as, as one of the bigger challenges. Wonderful contrast between sort of the public company and the family company. Ellen? So, um, morning. Uh, I graduated from uh, the MBA program in 1970, and I joined Lever Brothers as an assistant product manager. Uh, in those days, marketing was the way to the top in consumer packaged goods uh, businesses, and, and I thought I might like to run a company someday, so that's why I joined Lever Brothers. In 1987, I, I was named the president of the grocery division of Nabisco Brands. And somebody told me many years later, uh, someone who tracks those things, that, that I was the first woman in any US company to head a division of more than a billion dollars in sales. I have absolutely no idea if that's true. But I do know that it gave me some visibility. And that shortly after that, I was, uh, after I was named to my position, I started getting calls about joining uh, public boards. So the first board I joined was Kmart. And um, once I was on the Kmart board, I guess my name showed up in the computer a lot, although not literally, because uh, in those days, I don't think executive search had much to do with literally with computers. But at any rate, I got a lot of calls about joining boards. Um, I went, into, went on to be the CEO of the Nabisco Biscuit Company. I was the mother of Snackwells um, <laughs> during the KKR uh, LBO, and then the CEO of the Tropicana Beverage Group which was owned by Seagram and which we successfully sold to Pepsi in, in 1998. And by that time, I was the uh, A director of Ford Motor Company and the New York Times. So after we sold Tropicana to Pepsi, I decided not to join Pepsi. And I became a partner in a private equity firm that was focused on investments in small cap uh, companies in the healthy living and aging section. Uh, space, and I served as the chairman of several of their portfolio companies. And I also joined the Eli Lilly board. And sometimes later, um, I served briefly on the board of Cadbury Schweppes. So today, I'm an advisor to a number of companies. And I also serve on several nonprofit and private company boards, as well as three public boards. The New York Times Company, where I'm the presiding director and chair of the finance committee. Eli Lilly and Company, where I'm lead director and chair of the governance committee, and Ford Motor Company, where I've chaired the governance committee for a number of years. And I might add that um, while uh, the Times and Ford are clearly public companies, there's also a family element, element in both of those as well, <laughs> although it plays company. out quite differently in each of them and very differently from what you've been talking about. Well, it, you know, it goes without saying that all businesses are going through fundamental transformation these days. But the three industries um, that I'm involved in through my, three, uh, through my public boards, the news industry, which you heard Ann talk about, <coughs> the auto industry, and the pharmaceutical industry, are certainly going through incredibly dramatic transformations with evolving business models, increasing globalization, fundamental technology and product changes, and a need to satisfy increasingly demanding and knowledgeable consumers. So over my years on public boards, I've also witnessed transformation in the governance area. Uh, in fact, I chaired an audit committee at the time that Sarbanes-Oxley was being implemented. Today, uh, boards are clearly worried about, uh, more, more than ever, about their regulatory responsibilities and about enterprise risk management. But I think one of the things that um, they also are particularly aware they have to make sure they have time for in a very rapidly changing world is that they spent a sufficient number of time, a sufficient amount of time on strategy oversight uh, and discussion. Um, again, while it's still primarily very clearly, primarily management's responsibility. Over the years, as things have changed, I've spent some time with uh, institutional shareholders uh, from my boards. And I think the saddest thing is that after all the publicity about bad boards, 
some investors are actually surprised when they meet a board member, and I don't just mean me, who actually understands the company, its strategies, its policies, and business issues. And it's almost insulting that people seem to be so surprised if you actually know anything about those things. <laughs> but anyway, but for those of you who um, uh, sit on boards, and perhaps for those of you who don't, you've probably heard the uh, expression that when you're a board member, particularly in a public company, the rule is eyes in, fingers out. Mm -hmm. And um, but one place that that is not true, and I'm now going to go back to what Judy uh, was talking about, and to me it is absolutely the single most important responsibility of a board, and it has not changed, and that is the, over, the responsibility of overseeing CEO succession. And that is the board's decision. It is not a decision that can be or should be given to the retiring CEO. Doesn't mean you shouldn't listen for that input. That, that input can be extremely helpful and very valuable. But it, it is not the CEO's choice. It is the board's choice. It is the board's responsibility. And I agree with Judy. It is, I believe, the single most important thing that a board does because everything else comes from that. So I've taken part in a number of those transitions. I haven't added them up, so I'm not sure, Judy, if I'm up to, to your books <laughs> or not. But at any rate, I thought I'd talk just briefly about the three most recent ones at each of my three companies, because they're all very different from, from one another. Uh, the leadership transition at Lilly happened several years ago. Lilly has a very robust um, management development and CEO succession process, which if you're interested, we could discuss a little bit later. But because of that good planning, uh, over a number of years, there was a very well-qualified and well-trained successor ready. And when the CEO retired, and we knew when he was going to retire, um, the board was extremely pleased to elect John Lechleiter first as CEO, and then six months later, as was announced, uh, as chairman. At the Times, you may have read uh, last year, we spent several months last uh, going through the process with an outside executive search firm of recruiting uh, and interviewing both inside and outside candidates. And Mark Thompson, the former head of the BBC, became the CEO of the company in November. Now, the process, I think, is an interesting one. The, the whole board, the whole board, came together to develop the specs for the job. And I think the most important thing to remember is that the specs for your future CEO may not be the same as the specs for your current CEO, even if your current CEO has been very successful, because clearly there are new challenges coming up. Um, so after the board as a group developed these specs, we ended up with a long list of candidates. We had a small search committee that interviewed all of the candidates. And those of us in the search committee uh, each met one-on-one -on -one with each of those candidates. And then we met as a group and interviewed each of those, of those candidates. And then we uh, winnowed down the list. We then went to the full board with a shorter list of candidates. And the full board interviewed each of the candidates. And then we met together um, and, and made our decision. I mention this process because I think it was a very good way, one, of making sure that the entire board was invested and involved in this process, but it was also a way to make it less cumbersome than it might have been if you didn't have a, a search committee. So we used a search committee as a filter, but not, um, not as a block or as a way of, of creating kind of two separate entities that were, that were considering, uh, uh, you know, we didn't want first and second class citizens, I guess you could say, in, in terms of the CEO search. I, I think the most unusual CEO succession I've been involved in was at Ford. And uh, it was in 2006, a time that was particularly challenging for any company and, of course, any board member in the auto industry. And at the time, Bill Ford, who is the great-grandson of Henry Ford, was the chairman and CEO of Ford. Bill is an extremely capable person. He's also someone with very low ego. And his absolute passion and his heritage uh, is the Ford Motor Company. And so he is absolutely committed to uh, the survival of, of that company. And it is truly a place where the company, uh, for him, is far beyond any, any individual. Well, 
Bill and the board were very well aware of the issues that were confronting Ford and, and the industry. There's over, there was overcapacity in the US. There were, herb, uh, there were union and retiree costs. There were product mix and product quality challenges. And all of that was leading for uh, all US companies to dismal balance sheets and, and uh, financial outlooks. And while a lot of those issues came to the head in the public's mind in 2008, um, they were, were certainly all in our minds uh, many years earlier, several years earlier. So the board was very concerned, and so was Bill. And uh, in 2006, basically, Bill said to the board, I want help. I would like to find a new CEO who can replace me. I need a very, very experienced operating person who can make the changes that clearly have to be made. Um, there was no formal search. We did not hire an outside search firm. But fortuitously, um, one of the people that came to our attention informally was Alan Mullally, who was at that time the EVP at, at Boeing. Uh, several board members, including Bill, met, met Alan. And we recognized that if we brought Alan in, it would actually be the first time in the history of the auto industry that someone not from the auto industry would come in to run a US auto company. Uh, many people in Detroit thought that an outsider could not possibly be successful. There probably were a number of people, given the state of the auto industry, who thought an insider couldn't be successful. But <laughs> nevertheless, we knew that it was uh, break, certainly breaking with, with the tradition and, in some instances, breaking with the, the conventional wisdom. So we had a very lengthy uh, board discussion about Alan, not so much about whether it was insider or outsider. And uh, we believe that Alan uh, would be successful, and we brought him in. Um, as you know, this is a story with a very happy ending. Um, Alan's a great leader. He's done a great job um, at Ford with, and I think people often overlook this, he did a great job with the same team that was there when he came into the company. He made one hire, uh, a head of marketing that the company badly needed and we knew we needed uh, before he arrived. Uh, but he didn't bring anyone else in. And yet he was able to make the strategic and operational <coughs> and really, most importantly, the cultural changes that uh, really were required. So when it comes to Ford, all in all, it's been a great ride. Um, I think when I think back about kind of what I've learned from, from all of this is, one, there, there is no perfect way circumstances uh, change. Uh, CEO succession, well done, is a very long-term process. It is part of your overall uh, management. It should be part of your overall management um, development process. And it shouldn't just be one person you can pick from. You have to, you, if it's a successful process, you have choices uh, really all the way along. Um, secondly is, which I alluded to earlier, I think is, um, I, th I think it is very important to involve the entire board uh, in the process of, of, uh, of selecting a, a, a CEO so everyone has skin in the game. Uh, and finally, at which someone alluded to earlier, I don't think there are fast rules about inside versus outside. I think you, if you, you need tr fundamental transformation, that may be the time, and there's some research that would support this, that you do want to go outside. Um, and yet there are many times that it's very appropriate to stay inside. So again, it's like anything in, in most things in life. You, you probably ought to know rules, but you ought to know them enough to know when you need to break them. Somewhere along the way, I think somebody's going to ask, where do you actually find time to sleep? These are <laughs> yeah. very, very impressive. <laughs> um, good morning. Uh, it's nice to be here. And I think, Warren, you didn't know about the OPM class that I was in because I didn't finish my third year because of the birth of my son um, in 1997. So anyway, I also wanted to recognize uh, Susan Stoutberg, who's uh, sitting up there. And Susan has been uh, working with folks uh, at the Harvard Business School in helping to put together some of these panels. And um, so I just wanted to recognize her. And uh, so this is great, because we have such a balance of outside boards and public boards and family boards. But I'd like to ask one more question, Judy, that you hadn't uh, asked. And, how many of you are on not-for-profit boards? Wow. OK. All right. And then a last, just my 
idiosyncratic personal interest. How many of you are involved in family businesses? Okay, great, great. Okay, so it looks like we have a very involved, I w I'm not surprised, group of uh, individuals here who are uh, involved with not-for-profit boards. Obviously, there is a very big difference in the oversight of a board that is being uh, asked a questionnaire, the questionnaire of which is uh, organized by uh, an SEC, and that's in a public company. So there are very different pressures and expectations, but to the outcome, it's all the same. And that's the successfully steering a company, a not-for-profit organization, a family business into the future successfully. And that's what everyone, a board is a very collegiate uh, group of people um, and they do have to get along to get through things. My experience with boards started way back in 1983 when our family business uh, went public. And we were uh, at that time involved with putting together a first corporate board in very different times in terms of the, there was no SOX, there was no questionnaire uh, in 1983. Um, <clears throat> there really was very much uh, an unchecked uh, old boys network. And uh, I'm sorry if that sounds sexist, but that's what it was. And there's, um, I, I think, Ellen, the reason oftentimes that uh, agitating shareholders or just shareholders in general are surprised sometimes that board members, even of public companies, are up to date on their industry and their business is because there is still this overhang, which is not a good uh, PR uh, issue for boards of directors, of it being a network of golf clubs and, um, and where you graduated from school as opposed to what is the discipline that you bring to a board that helps round out the expertise that a board needs in order to function in this very competitive environment. So getting back to that time in 1983, going from a totally family business to being 35% publicly held on the New York Stock Exchange, being a New York Stock Exchange co company in the days when $250 million in revenue actually made you a mid-cap. Uh, <laughs> boy, that really dates me. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway. It really, uh, because uh, neither my father nor I, nor I had particular experience with public company boards, we really took the advice of the investment bankers that we dealt with and the law firm that uh, we dealt with. And, and uh, in those days, it was OK to have a, a lawyer from your law firm and an investment banker from your investment banking company on a board. So I'm just giving you the context of how Judy talks about 40 years. Well, yes, it's really been a quite a, an arc of experience from 1983. Uh, <clears throat> when um, I came to uh, OPM in 95, I had the good fortune of meeting uh, a classmate who was in a uh, leadership position in a, in a family business, a fairly large family business, a very different uh, industry. It was um, gravel and designer rocks and uh, material for cement. Uh, but anyway, at that time, he was putting together a board since he was then the designated CEO of the next gen for, for the company, representing the business interests of the next generation. <clears throat> and I had the good fortune of being asked to be on his board. And then I saw the huge difference between the pressures of uh, wearing the hat for a private company board <clears throat> as opposed to a public company board. At, uh, up until that time, I had not sat on a private company board. In that case, the interests of the family, very much what Caroline was saying, the goose that laid the golden egg uh, is really there for the benefit of the family shareholders. And it's not this larger body of shareholders that you are reporting to. Um, and it was the position of the board. At that time, uh, he put together, there was another member of OPM on the board, and then he uh, hired an outside consultant to be on the board. And he was trying to uh, successfully use the board um, to navigate through the very contentious issues <clears throat> that the next generation had with ownership 
and um, uh, the equity ownership and how much uh, each of the family members were actually being paid from the business, even if they weren't working in the business. <clears throat> so that was um, very interesting. I did that for a number of years. Um, I was also I had the good fortune of being asked to be on a bank board, uh, which is very different than some other public company boards because you have uh, yet again another layer of regulation and, and, and regulators and bodies to report to. And the board uh, got together once every month. Uh, and it was um, really an experience at the time. I'll never forget the CEO of our bank saying when, when we didn't have a good quarter, uh, that he wasn't going to go the way of the other bank uh, company, the other banks, because they were getting a lot of their profits from derivatives. And he said, I don't understand them, so I'm not going to get our bank's uh, money into derivatives. And uh, anyway, we were, we were subsequently merged into a larger <laughs> bank that does do the derivatives. <laughs> but, <clears throat> but he was a wonderful CEO. He was a wonderful CEO. And I do agree with uh, everyone on the panel that uh, that is a decision that you have to make. When I joined a an outside public board, the Rite Aid board, uh, eight years ago. Uh, it was uh, at a time where they uh, were transitioning in a female uh, CEO. Uh, and I was thrilled to be asked to be on the board with a, a woman CEO to the third largest retail pharmaceutical company in, in the country. And uh, that has been an incredible experience, again, with different kinds of regulations. So, you know, besides giving you a resume, um, I, like, like everyone on this uh, panel, thought what would be most useful for you to hear, since you have not-for-profit, for-profit, uh, family businesses, and, um, and I think one of the issues in going through, whether it is a search or a tough time, a down cycle, an attack from minority shareholders, whatever it is, is constantly adjusting your loyalties. Where, where, where should your loyalties be? Where are your loyalties? Um, how do you express those loyalties? And who else on the board has those shared loyalties? Uh, you'd be surprised, especially in times of extreme uh, pressure, how you find sometimes the, the most quiet board member or the board member who seems least engaged might become the most important board member. Uh, I, I had that experience more than once where um, the board member that was, has sit, been sitting back and not really th seeming to participate very much became the catalyst in a time of crisis because of the nature of his personality and his interaction during all those years of the board. Obviously, this was not a person who held an audit committee, was not the head of the audit committee, was not the head of any committee, but was uh, nonetheless became an important player in a time of crisis because of his sense that he didn't have a loyalty in any particular uh, direction. So one, one was uh, the issue of loyalty. <clears throat> Two, was realizing as a board member, as an individual board member, that you cannot manage outcomes. You cannot manage the company. You cannot uh, make the numbers better. You cannot, what you can do is what you can do. And oftentimes, if you are in a position where what you can do does not live up to your uh, expectations or your demands for your own where you're spending your time, it's time to get off the board. Uh, and that, that can be a, a difficult decision, but sometimes it's the right decision. Uh, so I think uh, just realizing what you can do and what you can't do as a, as a board member. And um, the other thing as an outside director, not as a director family member, that I, as a CEO and eventually chair of a family business, looking to my board for their very important uh, uh, participation in um, you know, governance and, and meeting all of the requirements that we had to, was um, they brought in and were the eyes and ears, in many cases, to the outside environment. 
And I'm not just talking about the competitive environment of the industry, but the environment meeting the world. Uh, often, certainly as a family business, you can often become too insular or only look at your competition as those within your sector uh, or that which is pulling at you know, the bottom line strings. And yet the board members with their various backgrounds, uh, I believe, have uh, an obligation and the privilege of being the bearers of all the news from the outside. And that's why, as a board member, I would um, <coughs> strongly suggest that uh, the board uh, get together amongst itself without management. Uh, we find that having dinners before board meetings or uh, it doesn't have to be golf. It could be mahjong. Uh, yeah. But <laughs> it, it, that the board needs to uh, get together and have some uh, opportunity to interact and to let their hair down and to discuss things without management present. And that, whether it's a for-profit or non-for-profit board, uh, in my experience, has been uh, extremely helpful and um, gets the board to be comfortable with each other and to really uh, know who to call on and how to behave during times of crisis. Um, and I'll stop there so that we have good well, questions. Let me just start before we open up the floor to questions, just acknowledge what a really extraordinary set of backgrounds I think we have here. We've got the family company and the public company going back and forth. You're talking about the for-profit and the non-profit and all the you know, similarities of challenge as well as some different ones. And a theme that keeps coming up, unless you're the CEO, uh, you're talking about CEO succession. And uh, my colleague Jay Lorsch, who's in the back of the room, of course, teaches an entire course in this. And I was delighted to see this panel was going very well because Jay was not asleep, but was in fact writing <laughs> furiously. <laughs> So with that, let me open the floor up. Yes. Yeah. I worked for a company, a few more people going for 10 years. We were a family company, and we are, we are public since 2008, five years. It's 56% of people. But the chairman of our board is the shareholder, the founder shareholder. Uh, and part of the management, as you can see, still from old days, and part of the management is New school, uh, people that we brought in from other companies. And, well, I, I would like to see your perspective, all of you. Uh, what would be the winning model? Because we didn't change everyone, right? We started mixing people from outside, from people that were inside. And the board is very much what it was five years ago. Our shareholder, our main shareholder, that has 27% of the company and is the chairman, decided five years ago. Uh, I would just like to see your perspective. What would be the winning model for a company like this, if there is any? Change of change. Try, the first thing you should do is to find a new CEO or just keep with the management that been there for ten years. Uh, change the board, refresh the board. Uh, we don't have a succession for our CEO. For so yeah. So <laughs> lots of things going on. Um, Some structure. <laughs> Because I was in private equity, the small cap companies, I dealt a lot with the company. We, we would buy a company, the founder would stay on, sometimes as CEO, sometimes as chair. So in, in, in that context, I've, I've uh, thought about this. I mean, it's a little bit of a platitude, but, but part of the issue is there isn't a fast rule, but part of it is what does the company need? So one of the issues with some, many founders is while they have been incredibly successful because they did everything, and that is, in fact, why this company was successful. As a company gets larger, the whole way you have to manage that company changes dramatically. And so both, in, and, and meanwhile, the environment's changing. So part of the issue um, is trying to understand what's required of the business in terms of what the business has to do to be successful, and then thinking about what that says about how you have to um, reorient the board, pot potentially the chairman or the CEO. So it kind of starts with, with what is the environment and what are the challenges, the specific business challenges the company's facing. 
who has to think about this? I think the board, no, the board as a whole, and hopefully management. And the board's probably prompting the chairman, because he probably hasn't had that, that right. relationship before. So he has to step up and think differently. And whether or not he's capable or prepared to do that, you know, the board can help. And that becomes a challenge for the board, is getting him to think that way. That's right. It would yeah. really... Um, can be kind of the icebreaker on something like this is if the founder who has his entire identity and career tied up in the enterprise has a trusted attorney or is particularly uh, has a particularly close relationship with someone on the board who can take him out to dinner and at least <laughs> break the ice that this is going to be on the agenda yeah. and right. and we might need to hire outside an outside consultant to help us with this. We might need to have some additional meetings to discuss this. But this, for your enterprise, which you love, is something we need to do. Mm -hmm. Yes, Melissa? Um, I'm a new board member, and I'm curious if you have any tips um, for when you were new to a board and didn't have existing credibility on how to, you know, in the room, how to persuade, you know, in a, in a situation where maybe you're expected to be more or less um, One comment I would offer, Melissa, is that in my experience, every board has a different personality. Um, there are certain things that are common to all options, and one of them would be um, to come prepared to participate. Um, I'll give you an example of the board I serve on currently. When I first joined the board, um, the, there were a lot of problems that were being discussed in the board meeting that were historical problems. And it was very difficult for me to add much to that discussion. And albeit I was not a new board member by any means, but I was new to this particular situation. However, where I was able to contribute immediately was the compensation committee on which I served because I had already served on and chaired numerous compensation committees. So I would just say, as you start out as a board member, find the area in which you can really contribute immediately. And, and you will know it. But uh, the worst thing you can do is, is not participate and not engage and get to know your fellow board members as quickly as you can because the relationships you build in the boardroom are very important. Yes, Carol? Yeah. Um, I, I run a hedge fund and uh, invest in small and mid-cap companies, and I spend lots of time uh, talking to the CEOs, controlling them to put women on their boards. And other than um, their embarrassment about not having women on their boards, it's hard for me to make an articulate case for them that they can understand about why diversity matters other than advancing some social good. So could you, could any of you articulate for me how you, how you would go about convincing men that it's good for their companies to put women on the board, not just, their, not just that they're advancing a social good, which doesn't always hold sway? Well, unless they're just, you know, manufacturing jack straps. And I, I, I think, <laughs> <laughs> and I think even that, having my career in retail, I know that 60% of all shirts worn by men are bought by women. Uh, they need to expand their horizons because of who their, in some cases, end users are, and to have an insight into uh, the you know the mental workings of that uh, that consumer, that decision maker, that uh, other board member in another company that they're doing business with, it is uh, simply not a reflection of the real marketplace. It's not a reflection of the market. Uh, even you know if you're in favor of more regulation or less, the market itself, if we take a snapshot as a reflection, is not all men. So I, you know, you, without without calling them cretins, I mean, I think this is <laughs> this is it is also it is self-evident 
it is self-evident. But there are, there are studies after studies coming out now that will uh, support your, your uh, pitch to the men that boards with women perform better. better. It's much better. So I, it, I, you can I, put your hand on those easily. I think the cause and effect, in my personal opinion, is the cause and effect in those studies is switched. And that the reason that is the case is because companies who want to have diverse perspectives, mm -hmm. regardless of whether it's male mm -hmm. or female, are those companies that will do better. Yes. And that is why exactly. they have women on their boards. Right. It's not because they have women in their boards that they do better. It's right. that it has to do right. with Diversity their thinking to start, right. to start out with. Their way mm -hmm. of thinking. It's their way of thinking, mm -hmm. yeah. The, the one other thing I'd add is that the, the three things that I've always used are what do our customers look like, what do our employees look like, and what do our <laughs> shareholders look like? It, it's a pretty nice. simple question to answer, really. I think it's also worth noting, just to go on, that it's not just one, but as you're talking, two, three, four, fifty percent. I mean, it's uh, uh, a lot of people think one is it. Kenny? Yeah. Yeah. I have a succession question. So I'm on a board of a public company. We have a great CEO, I mean, he's terrific, a great leader, he's turned the company around, et cetera, et cetera. We have a succession strategy uh, that's been narrowed down to one person who's operating as the C. Um, and um, but we've decided that we probably need to <coughs> accelerate the succession process. Uh, the CEO is very comfortable with it being a little bit longer than we as the board think it should be. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we also want to be very respectful of him because he has been a terrific leader. And uh, one of the issues that he's raised uh, is he'd like to stay on his chair, his chair and CEO. Um, we're, I saw you shake your head, that's pretty much But I have to say, I'm on another board where when we had the transition, the former CEO stayed on as the chair for a few, a couple, designated couple of years, and it worked really well because the new CEO really valued having that person there. We have not talked to the prospective CEO yet whether this is something that he uh, would or would not value. I think he would ha be happy to be CEO under any circumstance. <coughs> uh, so just wanted to kind of get your your thinking uh, on that. And if not that, how else can we kind of show the, the outgoing CEO the kind of respect that we think we need to show him? Do you understand my question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> Um, since I was shaking my head, I will I, I will comment. This is a, a a an element on which I really don't have much ambiguity. Are there circumstances under which that might be a good construct? Certainly, there were. Um, there was a prevalence of it in the past, but I think in today's world of governance, it's a it's a bad practice. I think. It, it, the time to cut the cord is the time to cut the cord, and that it, the new CEO inevitably is overshadowed by the chairman, unless there is a very unique personality there. And that person ought to be available. I mean, presuming you're, everyone's leaving on good terms and all the rest of that, that person ought to be available for consultation for the new CEO in any case. Mm -hmm. And it's a much better way to do it. I really have to say that I have become a great fan of the, the independent chairman construct. Mm -hmm. I think it is much better governance. I think it is much better for the, the functionality of the board and in the end, the collegiality of the board, very important. And I don't uh, disagree, Judy, with that as a general way to approach the situation. But I was in a, a situation that was a little unique in that the uh, leaving uh, CEO became chair and then sat on the board for a year after giving up the chair position. And it was because that individual for the company was the lobbyist for the company in Washington and there was a need for a transition but it is very individual and the person really has to have their ego uh, in a healthy place and uh, go to uh, the larger good and not have any open wounds that are going to be played out 
in the aftermath. Corrine? Can you tell me if you have experience with the uh, chief human resource officer being a support or a partner to a board in assisting with the CEO with the succession and transition? You know, understanding the inside perspective on the potential succession successors, um, or has your experience always been that it is a completely independent process for the board? Well, in my experience in, in a uh, company that does all of this well, as I said, um, the whole issue of management development is also part of CEO succession. And so in that kind of a situation, the HR person can be extraordinarily helpful in, sh particularly for looking at inside candidates, in, in sharing um, what he or she knows or what data exists and so on. And the CEO should be doing that as well. But just because the HR person is who the HR person is, that can be helpful. So I think um, in many situations, it's, it's invaluable input. But it's, again, it's only input. Yes, right. Can you tell me how boards <laughs> are currently receptive to issues of, and how they get the information, how it's introduced, uh, issues of sustainability, regulatory risk, reputational risk, and income discrepancy in a tip to Jay? Board co I mean, CEO compensation and top officer compensation and the discrepancy with pay policies throughout the organization. So sustainability and <coughs> pay policies, you know, do you, do you, how do you wrestle with that and the implications for regulatory or reputational risk? I, I believe certainly from both a private company perspective, but certainly from a public company perspective, a board member has the uh, responsibility of being up to date. The board has a responsibility as a total body of getting this information from the various reports, either outside consultants or from um, uh, the in-house counsel or from the head of the governance committee. Uh, there are uh, regular benchmarks that the board is always looking at in order to assess where they fall within their uh, industry, their competitive, uh, their, I mean, we're now required to list with, in the annual report, the, uh, your competitors that you are benchmarking yourself against. Well, good boards look at this not just from where it's being reported to the shareholders and the public at large, and it's on most, you know, is on the website, but they're looking at it on inside the boardroom in a much more vigorous way. And so if there is an issue like that, it is uh, incumbent upon the board to be sensitive to it, to understand. As I mentioned earlier, one of the values that you have is to bring some of the information from the outside environment into the boardroom and to, you know, breathe that oxygen, uh, additional oxygen into, into the air, into the room. And that falls into that category beyond your own, you know, individual responsibilities as a board member to be up to date on that. I, I know, Ellen, you probably Okay, can. last <laughs> question, Barb. Um, mine is, involves a crisis manager situation, a very specific one. And what you do, um, and this involves, and actually I'm running for the board of trustees of Penn State, and you on my spot. It involves everybody's aware of this yes. scandal that's engulfed the university. And this involves the first weekend when the news, there was a resentment that broke, grand jury, with some very inflammatory prose prosecutorial <coughs> accusations about anal read in the shower and a cover up by Penn State officials. Now, the board that weekend, you know, met and had numerous conference calls. And the president of the university, um, who should have been the one to handle the crisis, um, the management had been out in front of the press, was told the board would manage the situation, not him. Okay? And because also there was a question, the board felt that the president had not been forthcoming in what was happening. And of course, the president maintains, the now ex-president, that he did not realize or did not know that much because general counsel, et cetera. Anyway, so the board, without really talking to the president, talking to anybody involved, pushed aside the president so that the media went berserk and there was nobody to counter to the narrative. The question is, what in that situation was the right thing to do? My personal opinion, the president should have been left 
to manage the situation. They could have figured out later what his role in it was, because I think that a lot of this would not have happened had someone been there to manage it, because the board did not manage it. They were not positioned. It was not their role. They had no way to do it. I would love not only your input, but anybody in the room that has experience with this. I, I think just as a general rule, in, 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 any, in any crisis, you you need to have a point person. Exactly. I mean, I mean you, you can debate oh, yeah. whether it should have been the president. I don't know enough to have an opinion on that. Mm. But you can't just let everybody sort of run amok. So most board members, and whether it's crisis or just some reporter calling you, um, know uh, that, that any time they get a call, they refer it to the yeah. whoever, you know, whether it's the head of whatever, whatever. So the first problem was you didn't have a point person. And in any crisis, you've got to have a person that talks to the media, not five people that right. talk to the media. Right. But the question here is, though, as the board, there was nobody else they could turn to. The chair of the board was pushed aside. The vice chair was, was there a lead the, director? The CEO of U.S. Steel was the vice chair who took over, and he is the one who said, you know, and I think this is an issue. I want to ask about corporate boards because it may be very different for corporate boards where in a crisis like this, they said, we're going to manage this. But by not by pushing aside the one person who could do it, even though they had a question about his role in the events leading up to this, what was the right thing to do? Did Clark, did did he take over? A, uh, yeah. I mean, I remember reading about it and wondering what in the world was going on. But uh, but did he take over with? the approval of the rest of the board, or is this Al Haig, an Al Haig moment, <laughs> I'm in charge here, you know? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Everything I can learn, um, it was an Al Haig moment. The chair had been in seat inside the university. He had hired all the people in question, except of course the president. So he was shoved aside. The board, who, that's a long story about their insularity and non-engagement, you know, really were susceptible to whatever story a strong leader was telling. You also had the governor making phone calls through his intermediaries behind the scenes. But the question is, should you, would you have allowed a president who you had questions about to continue to manage if that was the only one to do it? Let me, when I first uh, agreed to run this panel, I took one look at the panelists and so you're giving me three hours. And they said no one hour and a sold out room. That uh, what I think we've had is first an extraordinary set of experiences from the battlefield in terms of what's going on. The second thing is that uh, caught my attention as a member of the social enterprise faculty is this group is identical to the alumni body as a whole. And that is almost to the last person is the engagement of our alumni in social enterprise and on social enterprise boards. There was hardly a hand that did not go up here. And of course, the issues we're talking about right now is a complicated social enterprise board, unpaid, you'll run amok. That uh, Jay and I have had enormous discussions on what is the same in for-profit, what is different in social enterprise. There are very interesting nuances between the two. But I just want to say what a terrific pleasure it was to moderate this panel, and I'm terribly sorry I didn't advocate a whole lot more firmly for at least two hours. Thank you very much. <laughs>